All right, so good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody here. We're going uh, we're gonna to get going here. We're going to open up our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 23. Is that a microphone on, Julia? Could you peek your head up there? Did you see that? All right, uh, Jeremiah chapter 23. Here's the opening text for this morning. Then I'm going to use it to base uh, the rest of the message off of. Morning, Nate. Good to see you, man. Just getting started. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. You have a Bible in the pew. That's page number 1018. 1018. Uh, matter of fact, let's all stand up if you would, please. And let's just all read this verse together out of reverence to God's word this morning. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. We're going to look at verse number 36. If you're in Jeremiah chapter 23, a Bible in the pew, that's page 1018. Jeremiah chapter 23, we'll look at verse number 36. Jeremiah 23, verse 36, uh, the Bible says, In the burden of the Lord shall ye mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. For ye have perverted the words of the living God, and of the Lord of hosts our God. Now, the focal point I want to focus in on that, that verse right there is, For ye have perverted the words of the living God. So if I had a title for the message, it would be, Ye have perverted the words of the living God. Let's all bow our heads. JP, would you bless the message, please? Amen. Now, you may be seated. Thank you. Now, um, what, we, what we've been going over for the past two weeks now is what is our final authority and what is our absolute truth in all matters of faith and practice. And um, I think the battle in the last days of Christians and uh, is um, even in the world, so to say, is that the battle in the last days is where is final authority and where is absolute truth. And as Christians, you know, we're, we're very quick to say that we believe the Bible, correct? I would suppose, I'd hope that we're all Christians here, we're all saved, born again, children of God, that we have received the gospel of the grace of God. And uh, before I even get going, the gospel of the grace of God is how that Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day. And if you have received that, then you're, you become born again, you become sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. Uh, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. We can't work our way into heaven. We have to receive the free gift that a loving God did for us. He came down and shed His blood on the cross, was buried and rose again the third day. It is finished. The gospel of salvation. Now, right after you get saved, the most important thing afterward is, is Christian growth. Okay, the Bible says Peter wrote, As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So right after you get saved, you want to know, what did God say? What's my instructions? What do I do here in the meantime? And we're going through all kinds of troubles and trials and things like that in life. And I just thank God that we could stand on the promises of God and that we have the promises of God. And that we don't just have 99% of them or, you know, if I was, if, if I was to tell you 99.9% .9 of the truth, is that truth? No, it's still a lie. We have all the truth, okay? We have absolute truth. And uh, we're going through the, um, the issue. This may be a controversial type issue it may yeah you know rub people the wrong way sometimes and look just excuse me because you know number one my delivery and my approach to it is is not the best i will admit that you know right away you know i'm, I'm one of them people that, that need to be told something straight up you know no sugar coating i just need to just hear it and um so i do you know i don't i don't mean to offend anybody but what we're going to get here in, in this morning is we're just going to do some homework on this subject of which bible you know when we say we us christians we believe the bible well, number one, there's, there's over there's 450 English translations. Which Bible is the perfect, pure, preserved Word of God for us today? And um, we're going to look at some of these translations. Now, if I'd have some volunteers, please. Um, who, who was my readers last time? Here, Al Alana, you get one, you get, you get, you get one today. Uh, Julia, you read last time. Son, did you read? You guys want to read again? Somebody different. Let's get somebody different. Let's get somebody different. Nate, you want to read? Okay, here, Good News Bible. Nate, you can get the uh, NIV, non-inspired version. Um, uh, Danielle, you want to read? That's the easy read version. Okay. So now, um, 
We all, we're going we're gonna to look at, uh, the title of the message would be, You Have Perverted the Words of the Living God. We're going to do uh, a lot of verse comparison. So just a recap of what we've been learning from last week. We went over the purity of God's words. Okay, we memorized the verse on, on Friday night, For the words of the Lord are pure words. They're pure words. We studied that pure means uncorrupt, undefiled. There's no error. There's no mixture in it. It's pure. You know, I always say, you know, if I give you a glass, this, this water right here, I was like, here, this is good water, but I'm going to just put a little drop of arsenic in it. Would you drink it still? Would any of you drink it still? You know? And of course you wouldn't because it's tainted. There's something wrong with it. Because uh, the same thing with, like, you know, corruption in milk or something like that. You, you want the, the raw milk. You don't want all kinds of crazy additives and things like that into it because it would stunt your growth and things like that. It's not good for you. Um, we're going to see that, you know, all these translations that come out with, these new translations every year, they, change, they say, well, we're just trying to update the King James Bible and we're trying to get rid of all the these and thous. How many of us ever heard of that before? Well, we're just reading this old Elizabethan English and we're, what our plan is is just to get rid of all the these and thous. Now, we're going to see that that's not the case and that these Bibles, these so-called translations, um, versions, uh, I like to call them perversions because what they have done, they have perverted the words of the living God. They perverted them. And... Uh, and for some reason, this is, such a, this is such a hard thing to believe when it comes to Christians, is the fact that God preserved a perfect Bible. That's, and for some reason, that's really hard for Christians to believe. Yet we believe Jesus Christ walked on water. We believe that Jesus Christ, the man 2,000 years ago, came down and shed his blood on the cross for us to atone for our sins. We believe that Mo Moses, God, parted the Red Sea. We believe that you know, people getting raised back from the dead again. We believe in the rapture. We which are alive and remain are going to get caught up one day. Okay, we, and, and fly through the air without an airplane. <laughs> That's pretty, you know, wacky stuff to the lost world. We believe in all that. Yet when we're presented with the, with the thing of, do you believe that there's a perfect Bible, people start getting all itchy and fidgety and, no, nah, I don't really know and things. It's like, this is one of the, the easiest things to believe is God had the power to inspire sinful men to write down, you know, the, word, the, the, the thing of inspiration. God got a hold of their head, God got a hold of their hearts, and God got a hold of their hand. The Bible's inspired, and, um, okay, if God had the power to inspire men, he obviously had to ha have the power to preserve it, okay? And that's why we, a little, this little illustration up here would be, the Bible stands on two pillars, inspiration and preservation. Without one of these pillars, it's a waste of time. You think about it. Inspiration without preservation is just a divine waste of time. What are you going to go through all the trouble for inspiring sinful men, and yet all of a sudden just say, oh, well, forget it, I can't preserve it. Vice versa. What are you going to do if you preserve it, and yet, at the end of the day, it wasn't ever inspired to begin with? That would be a waste of time. So the Bible stands on two pillars, inspiration and preservation. We studied a little bit about, last week, about the devil, his mentality, to know the enemy and things like that. I would, Jesus said, I want you to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. you got to know the mentality of the enemy. They, they teach you that in basic training and military and things, to spot the enemy, know how he works and things. So in the book of Genesis, we see that the devil is very slight. The first thing that the devil said to Eve, he questioned God's word. He said, yea, hath God said, question mark, that you should not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and things. He said, you sure God said that? That's, that same mentality is in the mentality of all these translations. And we're going to see why the King James sticks out above all the rest of them. Um, we went over inspiration, we went over preservation. Um, and we, we, another thing about inspiration, we, we, we agreed that... Uh, you know, God breathed upon this book. What, what here? This is, a, is this book is alive. This is alive. Because if this book was if this book was dead, if it wasn't inspired by God, then I'm up here preaching a dead book. And so all the rest of the Christians, if we don't have God's living words that He breathed upon, as well as preserved them, okay. Um, so now we're going to look at um, some perversions, okay. Like like that text said in Jeremiah, you have perverted the words of the living God. Uh, that's a, that's a good text to start out with. And um, I just want you to know that, uh, like I said, I don't, I don't mean to, to, I hope I'm not rubbing people the wrong way or nothing, but this is a very important topic that some Christians they never heard before. Some, they just never done their homework. I'm not saying that they're not saved. I'm not saying that they're not good, godly people. They're, they're sincere, but there's such thing as being sincerely deceived, okay? You can be sincerely deceived. You can't just go by. Imagine me teaching, coming up here and saying, well, you know, my version of what God said is, this is my version of what, and what I, what I feel that I'm going to go by my feelings and my emotions, and everybody's feelings and emotions are different and things like that. You may feel one way, I may feel another way. You may think one thing, I may think another thing. We have to have final authority, something that settles all these questions and all these 
these divisions and things like that. And that's what's sad to say is, I wish that the, that the you know, I would to God that the brethren would all dwell in unity. That would be a blessing. That the brethren, the, the body of Christ, saved, born again Christians, would all dwell in unity. That would be a wonderful blessing. But at the end of the day, how are we all going to dwell in unity when we're all on different pages? So there's a severe issue going on with we all got to be on the same page or it's just a bunch of confusion. And the Bible says, for God is not the author of confusion. So we have to have a perfect standard by which we judge all things, by which we judge all the rest of these translations, by which we judge the things that goes on in the world. The th you know, if there's one error in this book here, how do we know that there's not an error in salvation? That's why you get all these translations, these naturalistic translations. One of them was um, is it Thomas Jefferson, the Jefferson Bible. He took a penknife and, and cut out every miracle that Jesus did. And he just called it the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. Very humanistic. Uh, that's a, that's a, obviously a clear-cut perversion of God's word. And we're going to look at all of these, these others. They, they're under the disguise uh, of being called you know, the Bible. And, I, and that's what a big thing, too, is us Christians believe the Bible. That's a definite article. The Bible. We t studied about absolutes. Jesus Christ says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. Okay? So there's all absolutes. We got that down. That God is a God of absolutes. You know, you're either with me or you're against me. You're either hot or you're cold. I don't want you to be lukewarm and things like that. So uh, the, the question is, uh, do we have God's word? And Jesus Christ said himself, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So that's a promise. That's a promise of preservation. Now, let's just look at um, a couple of these translations here. Let's all open up our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to do a little Bible study this morning here. 2 Timothy chapter 2. It's a good verse. 2 Timothy chapter 2, page 1590, if you've got a King James Bible. Bible in the pew, page 1590. It's a very important verse because, number one, it tells us that we have to study. Okay, we have to study. And uh, I always think it's interesting, you know, we go to Bible studies and things like that, and yet, you know, the teacher or the study or something is, is using a, a Bible or translation that don't even really, that don't even tell you to study. So it's like, what are we doing Bible study for if I don't even have a direct command to study? We're going to look at just a, a, a basic thing on this one. So look at, um, uh, look at 2 Timothy 2.15. The King James Bible says, study. Number one, this verse tells us what to do. We ought to study. It tells us why we are to study, to show thyself approved unto God. Okay, not approved unto men, it's we're to be approved unto God. Every one of us should want to be approved unto God. That's a blessing. We've got to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. It's another reason why we study. It's not to be ashamed of what we believe in. And uh, what, I, what I do hope that this, that this study in this series uh, you know, that you get from this is that it will strengthen your faith in God's word. The, the Bible, you know, we have to have the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. Okay, so that's the arm, that's part of the armor of God. So I hope that, you know, I, what I want to do is increase your faith in the Word of God. Not in me, not in a pastor or a preacher or what anybody else says, but for you to go home and know that I have the words of God in my hand right now. It's, it's without error. Okay, man's opinions are outside of this thing. It's divinely inspired by God and divinely preserved by God. So I want you to get out of this. The Bible says study. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed. And this verse tells you actually how to study, rightly dividing the word of truth. We study dispensations. You've got to study the Bible dispensationally. You've got to rightly divide. Number a clear cut thing is there's an Old Testament, there's a New Testament. Old Testament, they were saved by the shed blood of the Lamb, an animal sacrifice. You fast forward to the New Testament, we're, we're saved by the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. You know, you go back in the Old Testament, you couldn't eat pork and, and, and clams and, and things that have cloven hoof and all that. Come in the New Testament, all things are to be received with thanksgiving, things like that. There's differences. So people say, well, that's the atheist and the humanistic mindset. They say, well, there's, there's contradictions in the Bible and there's errors in it, so throw it out the window. No, we have to rightly divide it. Every verse in this Bible is talking to a specific group of people according to a specific time period. And when you get those verses all in the right place, there's no contradiction. It's a very important verse right there. That's like the key on understanding the, the scriptures. It's big. So let's look at first off, we'll start off uh, with my wife. Let's see, what, uh, what's 2 Timothy 2.15 saying? Do your best to win full approval in God's sight. As a worker who is not ashamed of his work, one who correctly teaches the message of God's truth. One that correctly teaches. It, number one, takes out the way of rightly dividing. And it says, do your best. 
You know, now that's the interesting thing is, you know, when, when your kids are there in school, you told that, you told that kid that, look, kid, you got to study. You study, you put time in it. And there's, a, there's just even a difference right there. Well, just, just do your best, you know, just do your best. It's more clear as a commandment as to study. What's, uh, what's yours say, Lana? Who correctly handles it? Who correctly handles it? And once again, there's no, there's no thing on. We got to rightly divide it. Okay, there's, there's divisions in the Bible, clear-cut divisions, uh, dispensations in the Bible. Uh, Julie, uh, who has it? Danielle. Who applies the true teaching in the right way? Once again, it's it's out. And what's it what's it say? It takes out study. And what's it say? It says do your best. Okay, rather than study. What's uh? Who else has another one? Do your best to represent to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. So you all say correctly handles, and they say do your best. Do your best. So number one, you look up in the Bible, there's no, in any other of those translations, the word study shows up in the King James Bible three times. That word study is not found in any of these translations. The other ones in Proverbs, the other ones I think in Ecclesiastes, um, talking about studying. It's a very important thing. It's almost like, well, you know, when I really come down and I start studying these, I start finding there's some things that, that are questionable. They're, they're skeptical going on in those translations. Um, let's look at another one. Um, now, what you heard before is that well, all those translations, we're trying to update it, you know, because we're at old English, right? It's old English. It's old 1600s. We've got to keep it up to date and things like that. Well, with that mentality, you look at there's a Bible coming out with every, you know, every couple years or so. So you can't just tell me that that's your main motive. We're just trying to uh, update the English language or else the English, English language would have got outdated every single year <laughs> when you think about it. Somebody's after to make something. They want to make some money. They're out there to make money. That they, you put, you put, a, you make out a book and you put called the Bible on it. That thing's bound to sell. People want to get it. Um, now uh, let's look at some things about how they actually atta attack doctrines. It's not just uh, we just replace the these and the thous and things like that to make it more easier to understand. That's not the case. Look at First Timothy chapter six. Everybody find that. We're gonna everybody stick with their King James and everybody else listen real closely to the rest of the translations. First Timothy. Chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 4. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually in verse 5. It's in verse 5. Okay. Now, 1 Timothy 6, 5, and these are all things that, that we got to check. If you have a Bible in the pew, that's page 1586. Page 1586. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 5, it says, Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness. These are these, these are these people that think, well, I got all kinds of stuff. I'm living wealthy and everything's going my way. You know, God's been blessing me, blessing me. All this abundance of gain that I have. They think that that's, that's godliness. Look what Paul says here. From such, withdraw thyself. It's a, that's a clear New Testament commandment. To withdraw from those that think that gain is godliness. Let's start off uh, over here. Zoe, what's that say? Verse 5. That's it. There's no commandment to, from such, withdraw thyself. What about you, Alana? In constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. That's it. Uh, Danielle? No commandment to from such withdraw thyself from these people. Now, that's a clear thing because you start hanging around with them so much, they're going to start rubbing off on you and you're going to be thinking the same thing. Paul says, watch out for them, mark them. Matter of fact, from such withdraw thyself from them. That's a big clear cut on Christian separation. We live in a now day and age where Christians, they, they all want to commingle and intermingle and, and, and be all worldly and things like that. We got to have clear commandments on that. We need to withdraw from company and things. Nate, what's your say back here? Is a means to financial gain. 
That's it. That's it. Once again, that's all. They take out the commandment from such, withdraw thyself. Um, okay, look at another one. While we're in the book of 1 Timothy, look at 1 Timothy 6.10. We all probably heard this one before. Now I want you to look at this one closely. 1 Timothy 6.10. For money is the root of all evil. Is that what it says? That's not what it says. It says for the love of money. The love of money is the root of all evil. We all need money to live and survive and pay our bills and things like that. But it's for the love of money is the root of all evil. That's a definite article. It's the root of all evil. Um, and look at what, what's that? What's what you say there? A source of all kinds of evil. There's a difference between all kinds of evil rather than the root of all evil. Well, now we could see that there's already differences here. So one thing, uh, one thing I'm saying here, God said this, and then I got all these other ones, and I say, no, God said this. Well, how do you know what God said at the end of the day? We're supposed to be Christians. We're supposed to be people that have absolute truth. We believe in a Savior that said all these absolute statements there, and yet something's going on in the Bibles in these other translations where... They're kind of on watery grounds. What's your say, Lana? It says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people yeah. eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Okay, so once, it's, once again, does it, it gets rid of money is the root of all evil. Nate, what's your say? For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people... A root. So once again, there's a difference between money is a, is a root to all evil compared to money is the root of all evil. Imagine if you just said Jesus Christ is a way, a truth, a life. You know, you'd be like, well, what do you mean? He's the way. Same thing with here. The love of money is the root of all evil. Um, let's, look at, uh, let's look at Mark 2.17. Mark 2.17. How many of us uh, would hold that repentance is important in the Christian life? Repentance. That's important. Look at Mark two. Look at Mark two seventeen. What I'm showing you here is that those modern translations they're not just taking out the these and the thous. They're changing some significant things here. Look at Mark two seventeen. Mark two seventeen. Mark two seventeen. It's a good verse here. Mark two seventeen. It says, "When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them." That's page number thirteen hundred. Mark two seventeen. When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of a physician. That's good. So if I'm, if I'm not sick, I'm doing good. Don't come at me and start, you know, coming at me with a needle and tell me, you got to get this, you got to get this. I'm fine. I don't need a physician. I'm all right. They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. Okay, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We all see that? But sinners to repentance. Babe, what's your say there? Jesus answered them, or Jesus heard them and answered, People who are well do not need a doctor, but only those who are sick. I have come to call respectable people, but outcasts. Outcasts, that's it. Notice how they take out to repentance. Alana, what's your say? But sinners, period. The Bible says, but sinners to repentance. All right, look at uh, Nate. What's your say? I switched to the goofy paraphrase Bible. That's good, that's good too. That's, we could get a couple good laughs out of that one, too. What's that one say? When Jesus heard that what they were saying, he told them, sick people need the doctor, not healthy ones. I have not come to tell good people to repent, but the bad ones. Okay, but the bad ones. So, okay, at least that indicates that, okay, we're, they're trying to repent. What, uh, what about you, Daniel? What's yours say? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, It is the sick people who need a doctor, not those who are healthy. I did not come to invite those people. I came to invite sinners. He came to invite sinners. So they, do, they, uh, they take out that clause there to repentance. So number one, they're, they're, it's, it's, something's going on with their attacking. Repentance is gone now. Okay, here's another one. Look at 2 Timothy 3.3. 3. 2 Timothy 3.3. 3. Now, you know, you could come up here and you could paraphrase the Bible and things like that. You may not quote it, you know, verbatim all the time and, and, and expound on it and things. But you can't expect that to still have the authority of the words of God. That's a paraphrase. 
You know, I want to know what are the, because it says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So we, can ha we have to have the words of God. And yeah, you want to paraphrase it and you want to expound to it and say, well, you know, here's what he's saying, as long as you're not really twisting the meaning like crazy and things. But still, you have to have the words of God, you know, first off. Now look at um, 2 Timothy. Here's one. Uh, 2 Timothy. We'll go through a lot of verses this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, here's a big one. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 3. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 3. So what they do is, um, is it, let's just read it first. first. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, it says, well, matter of fact, in, in context, this is in the, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Then look at this verse 3. It says, without natural affection. Okay, now most of us would agree that it's unnatural for a man to, to lie down with another man, for a woman to lie down with another woman, for a, a, a grown man to lie around with a, with a little child, pedophilia and things like that. that that's unnatural, okay? That's unnatural. I even think it's unnatural for a woman to go and throw her baby outside the window and kill the thing and stab it with a needle when aborted or something like that when it's born and things. That's unnatural. So what does, uh, what's yours say there, babe? 2 Timothy 3, 3. They will be unkind, slanderers, violent, and fierce. They will be unkind. They just, they just took out without natural affection, and they said, well, they're just going to be unkind. That's a big difference. Unkind compared to unnatural affection, there's, there's two differences. Nate, what's yours say? So once again, they take out without natural affection. Danielle, what's yours say? Verse 3. They will have no love for others and will refuse to forgive anyone. They will talk about others to hurt them and laugh at them. So it says they will have no love without others. Now this is pretty clear that without natural affection is showing you that it's not natural for a man to be with a man. But by that saying, you know, they don't have no love or something like that. Somebody, the homosexual group or something can say, well, I still love this person. I'm still loyal to this man or... I'm still loyal to this woman while you're being a woman and things like that. Or I'm loyal to this little child. I still love this little child and I'm going to groom it and, and grow and all that sick stuff. So there's a big difference without natural affection compared to without, wow, uh, without, what did that say? What was those words used exactly? Um, they will have no love for others. No love for others compared to unnatural affection. Um, here's a good one. Look at, not, look at Psalms 917 in the Old Testament. Now, I'm going to tell you something in the Old Testament. You know, how many of us heard before, you know, if you don't get saved, you don't get born again, uh, you're going to go to hell. You're going to go to hell. That's clear cut. Now, in the Old Testament, I'll tell you, in the Old Testament, all these translations, the, the word hell is gone. The word hell don't even show up. Look at uh, Psalms 917. Look at Psalms 917. Psalms 917. The Bible says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. The wicked shall be turned into hell. That's clear. What's yours say there? Death is the destiny of all the wicked. Death is the destiny of all the wicked. Well, everybody, we could be sitting here right now and die. Some of our destiny is if the, if the Lord don't come back and catch us out of here, we're going to see death. Okay? So there's a big difference with death shall be the what? Death is the destiny of all the wicked compared to the wicked shall be turned into hell. Nate, what's yours say back there? I'm flipping back and forth between a couple of these because the uh, goofy paraphrase one does mention hell, but the NIV says something completely different. So we'll go with that. What's that one say? The wicked return to the grave, all nations that forget God. So the wicked return to the grave. Well, I could return to the grave. And I'm going to say born again child of God. <laughs> so there's a difference when you think of it. Compared to the wicked shall return to the grave, the wicked shall return to death. The destiny is death. The wicked shall be turned into hell. Danielle, does yours say hell? No, it says the wicked will go to the place of death. The wicked will go to the place of death. Well, they're, they're taking a slight 
at hell. Now, um, so uh, let's look at let's look at a big one. Now, who would want to try to to slight uh, hell and try to get rid of it slyly? That'd be the devil. It'd be common sense. Now, look at Isaiah 14. We read this one last week, but just to refresh our memories again. You know, how many of us ever heard the word Lucifer? We know that's the devil. <laughs> that's, the, that's Satan himself, okay? Well, there's, there's, there's other translations. The word Lucifer isn't even inside, in that thing. And we, we studied last week how uh, there's a direct connection with Lucifer being the morning star in the Bible, in, in those perversions, actually. And then there's a connection with Jesus Christ being the morning star. Okay, verse by verse. Now, uh, obviously the devil is behind slighting the doctrines of hell, slighting the doctrines of repentance. The devil wants you to hang around with people that think get gain as godliness. Paul says, from such withdraw thyself. Uh, Isaiah 14, verse number 12. Isaiah 14, 12. Is, this is clear. Because um, what atheists will do, they'll use this as an as a instance to try to tell you and try to you know, knock your faith in the Bible to say that uh, Lucifer is Jesus Christ. I've seen on, on a couple of videos before of these, and they're, all, and they're always using these perversions to try to prove their point that Lucifer is Jesus Christ and things like that. Uh, look at Isaiah 14, verse number 12. In the King James Bible, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? There's who is fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. There's a big difference between son of the morning and morning star. We know that the devil is an offspring of God. He's a created being, the son of the morning versus morning star. Now, Isaiah 14, verse number 12, it says what? King of Babylon, bright morning star, you have fallen from heaven. King of Babylon, bright morning star. Number one, they use Jesus' title, bright morning star, and it says he fell from heaven. And Jesus Christ says in the book of Revelation 21, I am the bright, I am the offspring of David, and am the bright and morning star. So right there, and it says king of Babylon. It gets rid of the devil. It gets rid of Lucifer. Um, Nate, what's yours say? Isaiah 14, 12. From the NIV version. Yeah. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. Okay. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations. So once again, it gets rid of that title, O Lucifer. He's gone. You know, if I was the devil and I was, and I was making my way, don't, don't you think God's words are still being attacked to this day? Of course they are. And if I was the devil, I'm going to try to get into God's word and I'm going to try to twist them and corrupt them and take things out to make God look like a liar. I'm going to try to cover, you know, cover my eternal destiny, which is hell. And I'm going to try to take out hell. I'm going to just put death. I'm going to put the grave and things. And if I was the devil, I'd, I'd try to get my name out of it. I'm going to just take my whole name out the Bible. You know, oh, Lucifer, son of the morning. Um, Danielle, what, does yours say Lucifer? You were like the morning star, but you have fallen from the sky. You were like the morning star and you fell from the sky. And, and uh, I'm just curious to see what it says in Isaiah 15, or 14, 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. What's everybody say in 15? Does it say hell? What's it say, Daniel? The deep pit sheol, the, pa the place of death. Now, obviously, you know, if I was to tell everybody you don't repent, you're going to go down to sheol. You think, you know, that's at a Korean restaurant or something like that. It's just funny to think about. But you're not going to understand what that is, really. Right? You, you repent, you're going to go to Sheol. You go ask ten people on the street, hey, do you know what, do you know what Sheol is? You know, you got to say you can get on a Sheol. They'll be like, well, what are you talking about? Where's that at, you know? You, if you look it up, if you look at another one, is Gehenna. You don't, you don't die, you're going to go down to Gehenna. Then think, what's that? What town, what city is that? You, when you ask a, a regular person on the block, hey, you, you know what hell is? They say, yeah, or, or they might scoff it. Yeah, I heard a hell, place of torment, and a devil with horns is down there and things like that. But that's easy, you know. That hell, that's an easy thing. In Sheol, they keep the Hebrew word. That's why they do that. And that's hypocritical. Because every time you get into the word heaven, uh, one of the words was uh, uh, Shem Yayim in Hebrew, Shem Yayim. Well, how come you don't just keep Shem Yayim in there? How come you translate that word and yet leave the Hebrew word fine? So it's like you're slighting. You see what I'm saying there? Like they keep... Shem, or they translate Shemayim to heaven in the Old Testament, yet they won't translate hell, Sheol. They won't translate that to hell. They keep Sheol. Well, why don't you keep Shemayim if you're going to be consistent with your translation methods? So there's some confusion going on. Now, now we're going to get into some serious things. Is They attack the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
I believe that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. The Word, the, uh, you know, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Not like the Jehovah's Witness Bible says the Word was a God, lowercase g. Most Christians, you know, most conservative, even liberal Christians, they say, I don't want nothing to do with the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Well, there's some big things even in these translations that attack the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the big one that stirs me up the most. When you're trying to make my Savior look like a liar and make it look like his words are passed away or gone, you're trying to make him look like he's just a, a normal man and he's not God in the flesh, that's what really gets to me. Some of those little ones you say, oh, well, you know, who cares? It's close enough. I don't want close enough. I want to know what did God really say? You know, that before we start getting into the paraphrasing and things like that, and well, what do you think this means, and what's your view on it? Forget about all that. I want to know what does God say first. And then we could talk about, you know, our feelings and what's going on with it. What do you think? What can I get out of it and all that? Now look at, look at 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16. This is pretty clear. 1 Timothy 3.16 1 Timothy 3.16, okay, that's page number 1583. So right away when those new translations say, yeah, well, look, we're just trying to get rid of the these and thous, that's a lie. They're getting rid of a lot more than just the these and thous. And that's, you know, come on, everybody. You know, we live in such a smart day and age. You mean to tell me you can't understand after one week what the, you know, verily, verily I say unto thee, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. People say, I can't understand that. <laughs> It's like, you don't got to be a genius. You don't have to have a high IQ or nothing to, to, to get a hold of that thing. Uh, and that's the mentality when it comes to the Bible. Is I'm in subjection to this book, okay? And you say, well, would you change that word, you know, this old English word, you know, wot not or I trow not and things like that. No, I wouldn't change it. I'd leave it go. I'd leave it go. Because what's to stop me from changing another word? What's to stop me from changing a sentence? What's to stop me from taking out a whole verse and things like that? You know, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. By the time you know it, you got a complete different a complete different message or whatever. You know, God's word's completely perverted. Like we started off, you perverted the words of the living God. Look at 1 Timothy 3.16. Without controversy. Well, the new Bibles make a controversy out of it. It says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. It says, God was manifest in the flesh. What's yours say? Just that clause. Who was it who manifest in the flesh? He appeared in human form. Well, he, he who? Really, at the end of it, when you think of it. Uh, Nate, what's your say? 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16. Yeah, I was looking forward to Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. Mm -hmm. He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached amongst the nations, was believed on the world, so once again, it says he appeared in what? He appeared in a body. Now, what's more stronger? God was manifested in the flesh, or he appeared in a body? You could say, well, he who? Is it Jesus? Jesus appeared in a body? Well, the Muslims would believe he appeared in a body. The Muslims believe, yeah, he's a great prophet, virgin birth. Yeah, he appeared in a body. But when you say, but he's God manifested in the flesh, they say, well, I can't, no way. He ain't God manifested in the flesh. So there's a big difference by taking out God in the flesh versus he is in the flesh. What's, what's yours say, Alana? It says, it says he was revealed in a body. Danielle? Um, Christ, was shown to us in human form. Christ was shown to us in human form. You know, that's like, that's a big difference. Christ, the Messiah, was shown to us in human form versus God, the creator of heaven and earth that flew out all them galaxies and all that. He's the one that came down in human form. That's a powerful thing. Um, let's look at another one. How many of us would believe in the Trinity? All right, which is, would be God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. These three are one. Okay, look at 1 John 5, 7 now. The, one of the clearest verses on the, the word Trinity don't show up in the Bible, but the teaching's found in there. And we know that man is composed of body, soul, and spirit and all that. Um, we know that everything, you know, length, width, and height, past, present, future, all things pretty much operate in a Trinity. But look at 1 John 5, 7. Now look what these new translations do on this thing. That's why I call them perversions. They perverted the words of the living God. Look at 1 John 5, 7. That's page 1637. Page 1637. Page 1637. Look at 1 John 5, 7. The Bible says this. For there are three, 
that bear record in heaven. Okay, in heaven. I want you to note that. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. It's pretty clear. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. You say, well, who's the Word? Well, John tells you who the Word was back in John chapter 1. The Word was made flesh and, and, and uh, preached among men and things. The Word became flesh. That's Jesus Christ, the Word. Capital W. Note that too. Now, what's First uh, John five seven say in that that one? They split up seven and eight. So read it. There are three witnesses, and then verse eight says the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three give the same testimony. So the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost are gone. What about yours, Alana? For there are three that testify. Testify where? You know, you got to think about that. Testify where? Because in here it says, in heaven. Okay, so what's that say? Keep going. The spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. So what happened to the Father, Word, and Holy Ghost? It's not in there. Nate, what about yours? First John 5, 7. For the three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Same thing. Father, Word, and Holy, uh, Holy Ghost is gone. So they, they take out, and that's uh, 7. And then what is verse 8? What is verse 8 in there? They say it again? No, that's, it just goes from, for there are three that testify, that's seven, and then it goes eight, the spirit, the water, and the blood. Oh, for there are three that seven, testify. Seven, seven, eight, eight. So they're combined, okay? So seven and eight's combined. When here, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, Christ came down in earth, spirit, Water and blood in these three agree in one. Both statements are found there. The one that's going on in heaven and then when Christ came down to earth. Spirit, water, and blood. So they take right there. That's pretty troublesome. Now you get, I forget what the, the scholars call that, the Johannian um, omission or something like that or something where you know, they don't think that this, you know, this, this should belong in there and things like that. That's one of the clear cut uh, texts on the doctrine of these three are one. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, that's, a, that's a big one. That's troublesome. Here, look, let's look at another one. Look at Philippians. There's a big difference here. There's a big difference here. And you know what the trouble is with all this? is Christians don't want to study no more these days. They don't want to do their homework behind these things. They want to just, it's just all about like this, this whole sense of feeling. There's some trouble that needs to be brought up that needs to be addressed. And it's some serious things. Because when attacking the divinity of, of, of my God... I know that that's, that's, at the end of the day, it's satanic. And you say, well, you could still get saved from it. Yeah, amen, you still could get saved from it. You get saved from reading a billboard, reading a, little, reading a little track that tells you how to get saved and all that. But at the end of the day, what about when it comes to Christian growth and things like that and getting rooted and grounded in sound doctrine, sound Christian doctrine? We know in the last days, there shall give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And, we, you know, that's a, and many Christians, they don't want to put a big emphasis on doctrine. It's all about experience, experience and feelings, more so than the doctrine of what God said. They're giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now look at Philippians chapter, Philippians chapter 2. Here's another good one on the deity of, of uh, Jesus Christ. Look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse number 5. Uh, verse, Philippians 2, 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, that'd be Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So he wasn't like he wasn't trying to rob God. He those times where Jesus Christ proclaimed, "Before Abraham was, I am," and things like that. He claimed it to be God. Okay, he accepted worship. You know that's what one of the things the Pharisees were coming to Jesus. What are you going to do with these people? They're worshiping you and they're bowing down to you. Aren't you going to rebuke them and things? No way. Thomas bowed down at the Lord's feet and said, "My Lord and my God." And Jesus just sat there and took it. If he wasn't God manifest in the flesh, he committed sacrilege and all that, and you know that he'd be a, a false prophet. But he accepted it. He he accepted being God. Okay, I want something. Want you to know that he didn't think he was robbing God. Okay, to be equal with God, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, uh, what's it say in verse six? So what's that say? Try to become equal with 
but he did not think by force that he should be equal with God. So there's a big difference. One saying he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, and then one saying he thought it was robbery to be equal with God. All right, Alana, what's your saying? Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Well, it says here, thought it not robbery to, to be equal with God. He wasn't robbing God. He said he thought it not robbery, and he was God in the flesh. So, Nate, what's your saying? Your attitude should be the kind that was shown by Jesus Christ, who, though he was God, did not demand and claim to his rights as God. Did not claim as his rights as God. So he said, I am that I am, the great I am. And he said, you know, Thomas said, my Lord, my God. He didn't rebuke him or nothing like that. He said, I and my father are one. Clear cut statements. And, and so they're saying he didn't, he didn't really want to be called God or something like that. And this one says, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So there's, there's some things there. And yes, Jesus exercised his humanity state. He was thirsty. He was hungry. He was tired. He had to sleep and all that stuff. But there's times where he exercised his deity. There's the, that gets into the teaching of the two natures of Christ. The two natures of Christ. The Son of Man, Son of God. 100% man, 100% God. You say, explain that to me. I can't. That's the mystery of God in this. 100% man, 100% God at the same time. That's a hard thing. But it's, it, it's a Bible teaching. That's what the Bible teaches. And that's why I, I believe it. So that's troublesome. Now here's another one. Look at, uh, Let's go back in the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 3. Here's a good one. Look at Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Here's a, here's a clear cut difference. Now you read the Old Testament, you're going to know that Jesus Christ made an appearance quite a few times. We call it in his pre-incarnate state. Before he became flesh of the Virgin Mary, he showed up as, in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord and things. So look at Daniel chapter 3, verse 25. Now if we're all familiar with Daniel, get thrown in the lion den and um, Abshap, Nechak, and uh, Abednego, they get thrown in this uh, fiery furnace. And uh, you heard, probably heard a lot of good preachers preach on that subject. You know, God's in the midst of the trial with you. God's in the fire with you. Jesus is in the furnace with you and things like that. Um, well, look at it. Look, look at Daniel 3.25. All right, so we know the story. They get cast into the fire, and the fire isn't burning them. Matter of fact, the fire was so hot that it was killing the people that were throwing them in the fire, the Nebuchadnezzar's guys and things. That's how hot that fire was. Now look at Daniel 3, 25. Now uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he was, he, was, uh, he, was just, uh, um, he was amazed pretty much on, on what was going on here. Look at 25. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. <laughs> That's pretty big. It's like the Son of God, because the, the, you go back in the old in the uh, in the Old Testament, this angel of the Lord, that, you know, they they took that as being, this is this is the God. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God God appeared in the fi in the in the bush at one point in time, you know, as the as the burning bush and things. Here, he, Nebuchadnezzar says, in the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. What's that one say? Looks like an angel. What's your say, Alana? He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Son of the gods. That's a big difference. You know, he said that the, the, the look like one like the son of God. And then the other one says, son of the gods. So what, what's the deal with that? What about you, Nate? What's that one say? The fourth looks like a God, probably lowercase g. A God. There's a big difference between the fourth looks like a God compared to the fourth is like the Son of God. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the one reasoning with Abraham up on the mountaintop. You know, Abraham's talking with the Lord. You know, Lord, you're going to destroy this city? He said, no. You're going to destroy this city for 40 people? No. He go down to reasoning with God. That was Jesus Christ there in his pre-incarnate state. Jacob, matter of fact, he was wrestling with Jacob back in the Old Testament. And Jacob said, I've seen God face to face. Um, Manoah, I think it was Samson's, Samson's parents, seen God, and they weren't destroyed. 
So that's Jesus Christ in his pre-incarnate state before he came down in the flesh. And that's one of the instances that was Jesus Christ in the midst of the fiery furnace, one like the Son of God, compared to he was just a God or Son of the Gods or something like that. There's a difference there. Now look at, uh, we looked at last week the attack on the virgin birth. Um, let's look at Luke 23, 42. Let's look at another slight attack. How many times they, uh, let me just tell you this, the word Christ is left out in the NIV 25 times. The word Lord is left out 350 times. Jesus is left out 290 times. There's over 64,000 words taken out of the NIV alone. That's a lot. Now, if you think that that ain't a big deal, well, that's kind of throwing something on our God saying that, well, what happened to his words? He said that they're not going to pass away. 64,000 of them are gone. That's, a, that's a, a serious thing. That's a serious thing. Look at, uh, look at Luke 23. Look, look at this situation. We're probably all familiar with this. The dying thief on the cross. Look at Luke 23, 42. This is, this is uh, Jesus Christ's lordship, okay, being lord. Look at Luke, tw uh, Luke 23. Look at Luke 23, verse 42. Um, right, I'm in the wrong page. Luke 23, 42. All right. Our Bible says, And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. We all remember that dying thief? Lord, he said to Jesus, he called Jesus what? Lord. He wasn't just some guy. He wasn't just some good teacher. He was Lord. <laughs> now, it was either he was Lord, capital L, Lord God Almighty, or he, or he wasn't, you know? So look at, uh, what's yours say? Verse 42. Then he said to Jesus, remember me when you come He just said, remember me. They took out him, the dying thief on the cross, claiming, Lord, for thou shalt call upon the name of the Lord, and thou shalt be saved, Paul says in Romans 10. They take out the word Lord when he's talking to Jesus. What's, what's yours say, Lana? So he just says, Jesus, remember me. Okay, there's a big difference. When it says he said to Jesus, he called him Lord. He wasn't just calling him by his, his name or something like that. He was acknowledging that that's Lord. That's our Messiah. That's the one that was from everlasting and coming down. He knew he was Lord. Uh, Nate, what's yours say? So once again, Lord's gone. Danielle, is Lord in there? Okay. So once again, the word Lord's gone. Now you get you get down into that. Lord is left out of those uh, the NIV 350 times. That's that's a big deal. Um, look at uh, here's another one. Look at Colossians 1:14. Colossians 1:14. You know, we sing songs about the blood, right? You know, the blood. Over and over again, we sing songs about that. That's an important thing. Look at Colossians verse 1. Colossians chapter 1, 14. I have this, this verse actually posted on the back of the door back there. And I want to show you the importance of this. You know, I, I heard before, you know, oh, you know, you Baptists, you put too much emphasis on the blood, the blood, the blood. Of course. Because if you don't, you're, you're preaching a bloodless gospel, you're preaching heresy. Jesus Christ didn't just break his neck in the desert and atone for our sins. He didn't just slip and fall and drown over there in the Sea of Galilee. That wouldn't atone for our sins. So watch out for those scholars and theologians that just say, ah, it was just more so his death. It was just about his death. He died a certain death for a reason. Then that blood's important. I'll show you the Bible on, on why that blood is important. First off, look at Colossians 1.14. It says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. All right, read, read, uh, read the NIV back there, Nate. Uh, we'll get I'll that. Uh, All right, babe, you want to read Colossians 1.14? By whom we are set free, that is, our sins are forgiven. That's it, no blood. Alana? In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. No blood. Danielle? No blood. Nathan? Yeah, but it was the same thing that you just mentioned. So they take out redemption through 
his blood, even the, uh, even the forgiveness of sins. If I was the devil, I'd want to attack the blood atonement of Christ. Okay, that's what I would do if I was the devil. That's exactly what he's doing. Look at um, look at Hebrews nine, or look at Leviticus seventeen. Let's just show you the importance on the blood. You go over and over. I got a message about that coming up in the next couple of weeks about the blood. That's that's so important. Look at look at Luke seventeen eleven. So by taking out uh, redemption through his blood, look at Leviticus seventeen. You say, well, what's the big deal about the blood? That's what's that? Yeah, Leviticus, Levitic, Old Testament, Leviticus 17.11. And you guys don't have to look it up in the, in the other per, uh, versions and things. Just look it up in the, in the Bible. It says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. That's the blood atonement. So by, by taking out even the blood when it comes to redemption and things, you're attacking the blood atonement of Christ. And we know the blood, you're not redeemed of uh, precious things of silver and gold, but by the precious blood of the Lamb, Peter talks about. So you got, you got to watch out for things that are attacking the blood. Here's another big one. I'm going to show you in here. They make Jesus Christ look like a liar, and they make him look like a sinner. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Look at Matthew chapter 5, and then we're just going to finish with, um, um, we'll get in a couple more next week. How many, here's just a big one. How many of us believe, obviously, that David killed Goliath? Art, do you believe still David killed Goliath, right? Amen. David killed Goliath, okay? But now at the end of the day, you got any of these translations, it says some guy named El Hanan killed Goliath. Well, so what's, something's going on. You know, that, I, wanted to, I wanted to kind of end with that one. That's a shocker. That's like, what do you mean? It's telling me David didn't kill Goliath and things? That's a big one. So you get about any of those translations, they say, oh, and killed Goliath. Something's wrong. They're making God look like a liar. Uh, look at, um, which one did I say? Matthew 5. I'm going to show you in those new translations where they make Jesus Christ look like he was a sinner. Um, now, like I said, you know, some people, some Christians, you try to shed grace on them. You know, they might not have heard this. They might have not done their homework on it. You're not trying to take back their, their good, godly people and things like that. They're, they're good, they're, they're sincere, they love the Lord and all that. Now, that's big. You, you love the Lord, you present them, well, look, your Lord's getting attacked here. You know, something is wrong. You know, they, that should be, if someone's attacking my wife, you're going to stick up for her. I mean, I'm going to stick up for her and things like that. I might get a little bit worked up. You know, I don't want nobody harming. You know, I don't want nobody harming her. I don't want nobody harming the Lord and making them, you know, slander him and things like that. Make him look like a liar. So that, yeah, that, that stirs me up a little bit. Matthew chapter 5. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. Matthew chapter 5, 22. And I want to show you this important thing that they take out, okay? Matthew 5, 22. Jesus says this. He says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment and so on. Okay? Read the rest of it. But the part that I want to show you is that that verse, that verse right there, Jesus says, if anyone is angry with his brother without a cause. Now, every other translation we're about to read takes out the clause without a cause. So it just says anybody that's angry with his brother, read, read one of them. But now I tell you, whoever is angry with his brother will be brought to trial. Now, what happened to without a cause? Okay, Alana, does, what about yours? Okay. Nathan, what about yours? Same thing. Same thing. Danielle? Okay. Now, Jesus said clearly, without a cause. I'm going to show you. Look at, look at Mark. Look at the book of Mark. Mark chapter 3. Jesus gets angry. <laughs> so, he gets angry. We're familiar with the story. He flip, he's flipping tables. And he's, whi he's whipping people out the temple with, with, a, with a, a scourge or something like that. Look at Mark Three, five. But let me tell you something. He had a cause. That's important. By taking out that thing, whosoever is angry with, angry with his brother, you know, he's in danger of judgment. Compared to whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause is in danger of judgment. Jesus Christ had a cause. So look at Mark chapter 3. Look at Mark chapter 3, verse number 5. Fresh our memories on this one. <laughs> he was angry, all right. Look what it says here in Mark 3, 5. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, 
This is a Jesus that, that your liberals and, and people like that, they're not familiar with. You know, they think Jesus Christ was just some good, lovely man. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to rebuke people and things and never, he, you know, Jesus Christ was pretty harsh. You read Matthew chapter 23. He's calling people generations of vipers, you hypocrites, you stiff-necked. He, he's tearing them people apart, tearing them apart. And he said unto them, or he looked about them with anger. What, what was the purpose of his anger? Being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. There's his cause for why he was angry. So the modern Bible says he, anybody's angry, they make Jesus. Jesus is saying this. Anybody's angry with his brother, he'll be subject to judgment. Okay, well, a couple, a couple chapters later, Lord, you're angry. So that's the whole thing where it says angry without a cause. You have to have a cause. And he had a cause. His cause was being grieved for the hardness of their heart. That was his cause. So right there makes him look like a sinner that's in, in danger of the judgment. That's no good. All right, now let's look at, uh, real quick, real, let's just, uh, we've got like five more minutes here. Everybody, uh, in the other versions, turn to Acts 8.37. Acts 8.37. I'm going to show you the, la the one of the last things they do is they attack the promise of preservation. Jesus Christ said, Heaven and earth shall pass away. My words shall not pass away. Danielle, is Acts 8.37 in that book? It just has like an A. It has an A. It's, it's an A. So they, they go from 36 to 38. Verse 37 is gone. They stick it down in the, into, the, into the footnote and try to tell you, well, some manuscripts contain, some manuscripts don't contain. We don't really know, so we'll just put it down here and you can decide. Now, that's a big deal because, you know, imagine if I said this. What do I got to do to be baptized? Okay? And you, you say to me, oh, nothing. Just pull over here on the side of the road. There's some water right there. And just get down in the water. That's, that's what that Bible's teaching. The, the, what do I got to do before I get baptized is, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? You know, in all, with all thy heart. If thou believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God with all thy heart, thou mayest. You may get baptized. So they just skip. They just skip that whole thing about believing on Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he, Philip's like, yeah, go ahead, get in the water. Water baptism isn't what saves you. So they take out that. It's gone. Acts 8.37 is gone. Nathan, is it in that one at all? Acts 8.37? What's it say? You can, Philip answered, if you believe with all your heart. Okay. Okay, what's that? Good, good news Bible? Okay, living paraphrase. They keep they keep that one in there. What about the NIV? All right, look at another one. Look at Matthew seventeen twenty one. Here's another one. Matthew seventeen twenty one. Now, wouldn't you think if you were possessed with a devil, and God God only knows how many devils are running rampant in America, <laughs> wouldn't you think if you were possessed with a devil, you'd kind of need to know how to get that thing out of you, right? You think that's important? Well, look what, look what Jesus uh, says here in Matthew 17, 21. You know, remember the disciples, they said, why can't we cast him out? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief and all that. And then he goes down to verse 21. He says, how be it this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. But by prayer and fasting. Okay. Uh, Danielle, Matthew 17, 21. It's A. That verse is gone. So next thing you know, you come to the text. And number one, that's Jesus saying that. So that's another thing. If you want to get technical about it, Jesus, his words himself, there's the remedy on how to, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. If I was the devil, I wouldn't want you to know how to get a demon out of you. I'd just take it out and put it in the margin and say, well, you decide whether it's in a text or not. That's an that's a instruction right there. This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Is it in that one? Is it in that one? Nathan, is it in that one? All right, what about, look at Matthew 18, 11. I'm just going to go through a couple of these ones. What I'm going through is omissions, where they're just straight up just gone. They're not found in the text. And I have to refer to man's footnotes at the bottom, and man will tell me whether that thing belongs or not. If it belongs, put it in. If it doesn't belong, don't put it in. You know, so I, I got to look to the scholars as my final authority. That's not the case. Look at Matthew 18, 11. Look at Matthew 18, 11. This is one, uh, somebody doesn't want the Son of Man saving the lost. Look at this, look at this verse here, Matthew 18, 11. And I would write these ones down to, to show people, you know, these are just clear-cut omissions. You know, they might not be able to get the whole thing about thought and not robbery to be equal with God and all this and withdraw thyself, some of those partial omissions. 
Um, but these are clear cut because they're gone. Look at Matthew uh, 18, verse 11. Jesus is saying, as he says, For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. That's why we all believe that. Jesus Christ came to save that which was lost. What's your say, babe? It's not in there. It's not in there. Danielle, is it in there? Nate, is that in there? So the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Jesus is saying that. And pick up another translation. It don't, he ain't even saying that. So who wants to, who would want to attack such a thing? That's the devil's mentality. Look at, a, look at, a, uh, look at Matthew 23. Well, I want to book of Matthew. Look at Matthew 23. Flip a couple pages. Matthew 23, 14. We're just doing our homework this morning in comparing. We're doing a little bit of studying, which people don't want to take the time to do in this day and age or anything. They don't want to sit down and, I suggest you sit down and get, all, get them as many translations as you want. Open them all up and see these things for yourself. You know, you, you might not listen to the word I'm saying, but do it for yourself. And you, you have a sincere heart for the truth and you love the Lord. You're going you're gonna to get stirred up when things are changed and taken out like that. Look at um, Matthew 23, 14. Uh, someone, uh, what is it? Uh, someone takes out the scribes and Pharisees receive a greater damnation. Look at that. Look at Matthew 23, 14. Here, Jesus this is one of his big chapters. Matthew 23, he's tearing them apart. He says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Okay, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. What about that clause? Matthew. Okay, so it go, does it go in the text? If I'm just reading the text without man's notes, does it go 13, 14, 15? It skips 14. It skips 14. So why am I even going to go and buy a Bible off of somebody that they can't even know how to count from 13, 14, 15? It's like this should just be common sense theology. Simple things on something's wrong, i got to now rely on men, i got to rely on the scribes and the scholars and things like that. That's not the case. Um, what about... Uh, Here's a big one. Mark 9, 44. We talked about this, the attacking the doctrine of hell. Mark 9, 44. We'll, we're, uh, we'll probably stop here for, for this morning here. We'll stop here for this morning. Last one here, 1230. I'll get you guys out of here. Matthew, um, or Mark, I'm sorry. Mark 9, 44. This is Jesus' favorite verse in the Old Testament. He's quoting it from the book of Isaiah. The verse that Jesus Christ qu quoted more than any other verse in the Old Testament is where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Jesus Christ, is, that's where they originally uh, coined the term hellfire preacher. That's Jesus Christ. He's the one that coined the term hellfire. <laughs> okay? And there ain't a lot of preachers out there that are hellfire preachers anymore these days. Jesus Christ, he, pre he had a three and a half year ministry. He's preaching on hell at least two times a year. Okay? Look at his ministry. How many times he's talking about hell? Um, look at uh, Mark 9.44, and I want to show you the emphasis that he puts on this statement. Mark 9.44, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Look at Mark 9.46, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Look at verse 48, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. I'm a believer in repetition. If I need to hear something and learn it, I've got to get told how to do it over and over and over again until I finally get a hang of it. Jesus Christ is the same way. He said, look, three times, where a worm doth not, fire is not quenched. Uh, those, those translations, they take it out two times. Right? Mark 9.44 is gone. Mark 9.46 is gone. They keep, I think they keep Mark 9.48. So he says it one time. Jesus Christ put emphasis on it. You've got to repeat yourself sometimes. He said it three times to them. Because we know we're a bunch of hard-headed people. Some, we're, we think we're listening, but we're not really listening and things. He repeats himself. So with that being said, there's, um, I wanted to end on, on 1 Samuel. Uh, just look at it. we got a couple, couple more minutes. Just real, one last thing just to kind of open up our eyes for some, you know, we've been Christians for a long time, and maybe this topic has never been brought up or something. But here's one that's, that's really just shocking is um, 2 Samuel 21. 2 Samuel 21 verse 19. I promise this will be the last one. 2 Samuel 21, 19. 
Okay, 2 Samuel 21, 19. That's page 502. All right, everybody get a King James Bible, and everybody else just listen closely to the other translations. Um, 2 Samuel 21, 19. It says, And there was, a battle, there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jerry Oregon, how many people have ever heard of Elhanan? How many sermons have you heard on Elhanan, the son of Jerry Oregon? <laughs> Not too many sermons you ever heard about this guy. How many of us heard a lot of sermons about David and Goliath? We heard that over and over again. Now there was a battle with God, the Philistines, Elhanan, the son of Jerry Oregon, a Bethlehemite slew, in the King James Bible, he slew the brother of Goliath. And you cross-reference that with 1 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 5. You find out the brother of Goliath, his name was Lami. It says it straight up in 1 Chronicles, uh, where is it? 1 Chronicles 20, I'll just read it real quick. 1 Chronicles 25, it says, Elhanan, the brother, the son of Jer, slew Lami, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite. So the brother of Goliath, was his name was Lami. Now, uh, what's yours say there, babe, in 2 Samuel? 21.19. So that one just said Alhanan killed Goliath. You can't have two people killing somebody. David was the one that slung a stone at him and stood over him and chopped his head off. What about that one? In another battle with the Philistines at Gob, Alhanan, son of Jerogim, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath the Gittite. He had a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod. So Alhanan killed Goliath. Well, the, 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 the Bible says David killed Goliath, so there's, there's something going on there. Now, that's don't take the scholar, that don't take a rocket scientist. Something's going on, okay? Now, I'm going to stop there, and um, I, I want you to pray on this. I want you to think on this. I want you to um, just, just really take your time and, and study it and, and look at it, because this is starting to get like really pushed aside that this isn't an essential thing. Well, number one, it's, it's essential because you know, we're born again by the Word of God. And if there's errors in this book and we don't have the perfect Word of God, how do we know anything? We're just a bunch of agnostics scratching around in the dark standing up here proclaiming that we got absolute truth, and yet you don't even believe you have absolute truth. I always think that's very hypocritical. If I was to stand up here and start preaching, you know, thus saith the Lord, and I'm up here saying this is what God said, and at the end of the day I really don't believe that's what God said, or I don't really know what God said. That's, uh, so I believe in standing up for absolute truth and final authority. So uh, with that being said, uh, JP, would you uh, bless the message please? Amen. Amen. Now, like I say, I just I pray that what this does is help strengthen your faith in the Bible. Okay, I pray that help it strengthens your faith and you stand on the promises. And we're gonna sing a good song on here about uh, "Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." Page two fifty seven. Two fifty seven. Somebody perverted the words of the living God. I want you to think about that. It's opening text this morning. Perverting the words of the living God. Page 257. Uh, I believe it's all three verses. If it's not, we're just going to do one, two, or three.
was like that, that last, uh, you know, just to take him at his word, just to know, thus saith the Lord. You know, it's like we couldn't even sing these songs with a pure heart. We didn't know what thus saith the Lord actually said. We, 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 almost every song that we sing has some great deal to say about the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ. And um, any, is there any questions about anything today? Anything, write, write them down, you know, come on Fridays and stuff. We'd be glad to sit down and take the time to talk about them, you know. So um, thank you for hanging in there. I do appreciate your guys' patience. Um, next week, I, like, what I, what I want to do, because I'm going to get back on uh, our verse-by-verse -verse study, you know, learning about the Bible line upon line. We will get back into some practical things on how to apply to our Christian life. But, you know, once again, it's always like, you know, the people that we've got here, in, you know, come. I want you guys to be rooted and grounded on the Bible thing. Because it's like, why am I going to, imagine me teaching a verse-by-verse -verse Bible, and that next thing I know, I come to it, and the verse is gone. You, what are you going to do? You know, well, you know, we, this verse might not be in here, it might be in here, we don't know if it's supposed to be in here or not. I don't even know how you could teach a verse-by-verse -verse Bible study if you don't have every verse by verse, you know, and then we got to go back to the scholars, and go. it's like, so I want everybody to be rooted and grounded on the perfect Bible before we get into, we're going to, Lord willing, finish up the book of Galatians uh, in a couple weeks here, so um, thank you, does anybody want to turn off that camera, just that middle button please?